Welcome everyone. My name is Melanie Carver and I'm the Vice President of Community Services for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Kids with Food Allergies is our food allergy division. We're happy you've joined us for a webinar on food allergies and risk factors for anaphylaxis. This is an important topic that affects us all, so we hope we can provide helpful information about managing risks. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction. Today's discussion can be an uncomfortable topic for some as we will be talking about the risk of death. So if you have young ears in the room, please take a moment to change your audio to headphones or earbuds. We will also be discussing strategies for how to teach your child or teens about how to be safe and reduce risk of anaphylaxis. We hope by the end of today's presentation you will have more tools to help you prepare, communicate, and advocate for your or your child's needs to help reduce the risk of anaphylaxis. AFA's webinar series is part of our independent education program. This webinar is made possible in part through sponsorship by Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners for the financial support that enables us to develop free educational programs for families. Please take note that this webinar is of a general nature only and it is not medical advice or legal advice. We're going to launch a couple of questions for you before we begin. Please take a moment to vote for your answers. This will help us learn more about our audience today. If you have questions during the presentation, you can enter them into your questions box on the GoToWebinar platform that is displaying on your device. At the end of the presentation, we will answer audience questions as time allows. We will also be giving away prizes to three randomly selected attendees. Today we have several prizes from our Certified Asthma and Allergy Friendly Program. When we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us as we will take your feedback very seriously to help improve the future direction of our programming. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will receive a follow-up email within a few days, and the email will include a link to the video as well as a list of related resources that were mentioned in today's discussion. And now I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Margaret Redmond. Guest speakers for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers without compensation. On behalf of AFA and Kids with Food Allergies, I'm very grateful to Dr. Redmond who donated her time to be here with us today. Dr. Redmond has been practicing at Nationwide Children's Hospital since September 2016. She has an academic interest in anaphylaxis and food allergies in the summer camp and pre-hospital settings. Dr. Redmond, thank you so much for being with us. Would you like to quickly review the poll results before you begin your presentation? I would. Uh, yes, okay. So in answering the question, have you or your child ever experienced anaphylaxis, uh, 38 percent of the attendees said yes and 58 said no and 4 percent said I'm not sure. And then in answering the question, do you feel comfortable using an epinephrine auto injector? 55 percent said yes, 16 uh, percent said no, and 29 percent said I'm not sure. All right, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose for this talk. All right. um, the objectives for the webinar today are to briefly define food allergy and to discuss the mechanisms behind that reaction the reactions that can occur, uh, delineate the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, discuss the frequency of fatal anaphylaxis, and address the risk, the risk factors for fatal anaphylaxis and to discuss how to mitigate these risks. All right, so first a little basic definition. So a food allergy is defined as an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. And there are two sort of broad types of food allergy, those that are mediated by IgE, which is an antibody, and those that are non-IgE mediated. When we talk about IgE mediated reactions, uh, these are the reactions that we think about that can cause anaphylaxis and typically involve a rapid onset of histamine mediated symptoms that can include hives, cough, vomiting, um, and 
in contrast, the non-IgE mediated reactions are believed to be driven primarily by the T cells, which is another um, portion of our immune system. Um, and the two most common types are allergic proctocolitis, which um, commonly is referred to as uh, milk protein allergy, though other foods can cause it. And that's what it causes sort of discomfort and uh, stool, blood in the stool in um, breastfed infants. And then food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome or, or FPIs, which causes a delayed reaction with um, typically pretty impressive vomiting starting two to six hours after ingestion of a food. Um, but it has an absence of some of those other symptoms that we associated with IgE mediated symptoms like respiratory symptoms or um, skin findings. When we're testing for food allergy, we have um, skin prick and blood testing that look for the presence of IgE to specific food proteins. Um, and this can help us assess the risk of IgE mediated allergic reaction with ingestion of that specific food. Um, the testing's not diagnostic, um, but it does help us kind of risk stratify people. Um, there's no validated testing available to predict risk for non-IgE mediated reactions. Um, and so, and the, but the gold standard of diagnosing food allergy for either IgE or non-IgE mediated reactions is to do a food challenge um, where the food is given and then the child or adult is monitored for symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. The prevalence of food allergy is difficult to state definitively, um, but studies that have looked at it have placed it from four to eight uh, percent in the U.S. population. And the foods that are responsible for ninety percent of food allergic reactions are peanut, tree nut, cow's milk, egg, soy, wheat, shellfish, and fish. When we think about the most common allergens in younger children, uh, that tends to be cow's milk, egg, and peanut. And then in adults, peanut, tree nut, and shellfish. When we talk about anaphylaxis, this is a s systemic allergic reaction uh, that is kind of the most significant possible outcome resulting from an IgE-mediated allergic reaction. Um, anaphylaxis can be life-threatening uh, and is typically rapidly progressing. When we attempt to define anaphylaxis, Broadly, we talk about it as an allergic reaction that involves two organ systems. Uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, or the NIAID, which is a, a part of the NIH, published diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis in 2006. Uh, prior to that time, there was no universally accepted definition for anaphylaxis. Um, the NIAID criteria, which I'm going to show you in a, um, in a graphic in the next slide were looked at in an emergency room setting uh, and were shown to be 96.7% sensitive and 82.4% specific. And so what that means is that this criteria is very good at kind of avoiding false negatives, uh, but it does it's not quite as good at as avoiding false positives. But if you're going to be screening or using a diagnostic criteria for something that is life-threatening, you certainly want to err on the side of catching everyone. Um, and that in, can often involve having a few false positives. Um, this is the NIAID criteria that I spoke about. So <clears throat> when we look at this graphic, I think it can be helpful to use this to think about kind of the components that go into making a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. Um, and so I think the first part is timing. Um, and so anaphylaxis typically develops within 30 to 60 minutes after ingestion of uh, the food or exposure to the medication or venom that someone may be allergic to. And so the first pathway, the one with uh, the number one on top, is for someone who does not have a known allergy. And so in these patients, you can make the diagnosis with the acute onset of symptoms, so again, within minutes to several hours, and they need to involve um, the skin or mucosa. Um, so this is gonna be itching, redness, hives, swelling, and then either um, respiratory symptoms or 
cardiovascular symptoms. So the respiratory symptoms can involve shortness of breath, wheezing, stridor, um, decrease in the oxygen level of the blood, uh, and the cardiovascular symptoms are going to involve hypotension or, or low blood pressure and um, symptoms that are resulting from that low blood pressure. So these can be dizziness, fainting, or um, feeling weak. So the second pathway, this is for someone who has um, a known allergen and was exposed to that allergen. Um, so again, the symptoms develop rapidly and you again are looking from symptom, for symptoms from two of the following. So the skin, respiratory, and cardiovascular findings that we already mentioned, and then the addition of GI symptoms. So often this is going to be vomiting, nausea, belly pain, um, and possibly diarrhea. Now, so a lot of you might ask, well, what about GI symptoms? Can't they be present um, in the initial presentation? And they certainly can, um, but GI symptoms are not as specific. Um, none of these findings are specific on their own for allergy, but the GI symptoms are lots of other processes that can cause vomiting and belly pain. And so to make the diagnosis in the absence of a history, uh, you really want to be looking for things that are slightly more specific for anaphylaxis. And then the third uh, pathway is someone, again, with a known allergy who is exposed to an allergen and then rapidly develops hypotension. Um, that in isolation can meet criteria for anaphylaxis. When you are thinking about children in your care, either as a caregiver, a teacher, a parent, you know, I think thinking about this pathway and also the timing is very helpful. So, you know, if your child develops a few hives, it's certainly something that you want to be monitoring closely, but that doesn't meet criteria for anaphylaxis on its own. So certainly anaphylaxis is very concerning for patients with food allergy and their caregivers. Um, the next few slides are going to attempt to contextualize the risk of that anaphylaxis. So <clears throat> the prevalence of anaphylaxis in the general population is difficult to determine um, definitively. However, some studies estimate it to be between one and a half to slightly more than two percent in the general population. Studies looking at hospital admissions for anaphylaxis noted that the frequency of hospital admissions for anaphylaxis more than doubled um, between 2000 and 2009. Um, but mor mortality rates appeared to be stable. Um, so we'll talk about this a little bit more in the following slides, but if you use sort of the most conservative, conservative data, the data that gives you the highest potential, um, even then the mortality rates were stable at 0.63 to 0.76 per million uh, people in the population. Fatal anaphylaxis is certainly um, tragic, though fatalities from food allergic reactions are rare. Um, but because of this potential tragic outcome, this is why correct diagnosis, prevention, and preparation are so important. Um, one thing I always try to mention um, to families that I'm taking care of is that there's a known phenomenon that humans, I mean all humans, tend to inflate the risk of uncommon causes of death. Um, it's not clear if it's because uncommon causes of death are more newsworthy and noteworthy and they receive more attention in a community um, and that shifts the perception of risk or if there's a different cause for this misperception. So while the misperception has been found in studies, it, the cause of it is, is not clear. But because of that phenomenon, it's so important to accurately understand the risk so that you can best learn how to prevent those allergic reactions. So there was a group led by Ma um, who looked at several na national databases, but the fatality data that they um, a a compiled came from death certificate data from 1999 to 2009. And they looked at all causes of anaphylaxis together, um, and they found that actually the highest rate of fatality due to anaphylaxis was in persons aged 75 to 84 years of age at a rate of two per million population, and was the lowest in children um, 17 years and 
younger at a rate of um, 0 0.1 per million population. On death certificate, um, on death certificates, anaphylaxis, the cause of it is often not recorded, but when it was, 28% um, of the time medication was the listed cause and 13% of the time it was venom. Um, there was a more recent meta-analysis that was published in 2014, and this looked at the incidence of fatal anaphylaxis related to food specifically. Um, so it compiled data from 10 relevant studies, and it looked at um, and it found an incidence of fatal anaphylaxis at a rate of 1.81 per million food allergic persons, person years. Um, and they used a 3% food allergy prevalence rate, um, which if you remember from the beginning of the talk is, is lower than most estimates of uh, food allergy prevalence in the United States. Um, when they looked at specifically this risk for persons who were 1 to 19 years of age, they found a rate of 3.25 per million food allergic person years. And if they looked at persons with a peanut allergy specifically, uh, a rate of 2.13 per million food allergic person years, uh, though um, only seven studies were able to be included in, in that analysis. Um, so the way that they determined the incident rate, the incidence of that was was based on the prevalence of food allergy in the in the general population. So they looked at um, an even more conservative food allergy prevalence, uh, two percent of the population, and with those numbers, um, the numbers are slightly higher, but the uh, incidence of fatal anaphylaxis from food is still uh, two point seven per million. Um, uh, food allergic person years for the total population, uh, 6.13 per million food allergic person years for those under 19, and 4.25 um, for those with peanut allergy. So I think sometimes it's important to sort of think about that risk in, um, in context with other risks that we all have every day just going about our daily lives. So even if we take this most conservative measure um, and we look at persons aged 0 to 19, um, that risk places the risk of fatal anaphylaxis at slightly less than 1 in 100,000. So if you compare that to the risk in this age group from death due to accident, um, that risk is uh, slightly less than 1 in uh, 10,000. So there's a, uh, a tenfold risk um, increase from death due to accident versus um, anaphylaxis in this, in this food allergic group. And, the desk, and even if you look at the risk of death due to murder, that's slightly higher in persons with food allergy than risk of fatal anaphylaxis. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that we need to all shift our concern um, from food allergy anaphylaxis uh, to concern for murder, but I think it's important to think about um, the risk of food allergy in um, in food allergic children, sort of in the context of the of other things that are are a risk factor. Um, so, for instance, when I'm thinking about this summer, I'm going to be going on a a trip with my family, and there will be a pool involved, and so I've already thought about ways that I can mitigate the risk of my young children with a, access to the pool. Um, and so, similarly, the looking at risk of fatal anaphylaxis is thinking of that, yes, there's a risk and, and we want to be able to, to mitigate that risk as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> so when we are saying what are the risk factors for fatal anaphylaxis, there have been several studies examining this in food allergic persons specifically. Um, so the first published um, kind of case series came out in the early 90s, um, and then a voluntary registry was set up in one of the allergy governing bodies in the United States to collect data on fatal anaphylaxis from food allergy. And um, Bach and his group uh, published results from that registry um, that looked at data from 1994 to 1999. Uh, this registry identified 32 fatalities um, of which 21 had complete data available for the researchers. This study was the first to identify the following risk factors. Um, the first is age. So 95% of the um, smaller group that had complete data and 90% of the group that had um, 
of the full uh, group were over 12 years old, and 67% were between the ages of 13 and 21 years of age. Um, and then the type of food that you are allergic to. Uh, so 67% of the complete data group reacted to peanut and the remaining 33 reacted to a tree nut. Um, if you look at the full data set that includes some incomplete data, one person reacted to milk and one to fish, uh, but the vast majority were peanut or tree nut. Um, the third risk factor identified was delayed epinephrine. Uh, so only 10% of the persons included in the registry received epinephrine in a timely fashion. The fourth risk factor identified was asthma. So of the 32 um, fatalities in the registry, 25% of, I'm sorry, 25 of them had uh, data on the presence of asthma. And of those 25, 24 had a diagnosis of asthma. So if we look at some of these risk factors individually, um, for food allergy related allergic reactions, being a teenager or young adult carries the highest risk for fatal anaphylaxis. This finding, again, initially reported by Bach, but was shown in registry data over a similar late 90s time frame in the UK, and then also incidence data um, published by Uma Sunthar and their group. Um, and this increased risk for a severe reaction was also seen in a, a threshold dose study, a study where they we're trying to identify kind of the what's the smallest dose that causes reaction. And um, in that study, they found that persons over 15 years of age um, carried an increased risk for severe reaction. It has not been definitively proven why um, people in this age range are at increased risk, um, but several hypotheses have been suggested. So um, some of them are due to sort of typical teenage risk-taking behavior. So, Increased risk taking with eating, refusing to carry their epinephrine auto injector, denial of disease, um, other risk taking behavior such as drinking alcohol, um, which can impair judgment uh, about what to eat. And then, um, but there also may be some physiologic changes that occur with age that make um, a person less adaptable to those histamine mediated symptoms uh, that are triggered with the allergic reaction. There was um, a survey done um, looking at people between 13 to 21 years of age with food allergy. This was published by Samson and uh, Schizer in uh, 2006, and it revealed the following trends. So 60% of these young people considered themselves very prepared for self-treatment. 61% reported that they always carried an epinephrine auto-injector. 64% reported that they always read labels. 54% um, admitted, admitted to eating a tiny amount of food known to contain an allergen, and 61% reported that all their friends knew about their food allergy. So if we look at this, so um, half of these young people are admitting to knowingly eating some food that they are allergic to, um, and only slightly more than half feel very prepared and are always carrying their auto-injector, always reading labels, and um, have notified their their friends and those closest to them about their food allergy. Um, also interestingly, the respondents of this um, survey noted that they were least likely to have their epinephrine auto-injector available if they were playing sports, wearing tight clothing, or hanging out with their friends. If we look at um, nut allergy as a risk, so um, the Pumphrey data out of the UK also showed a preponderance of peanut and nut allergy as the cause of fatal anaphylaxis, but at a lower rate than the initial Bach data, um, with only 67% of um, fatal food anaphylaxis reporting peanut or tree nut as a causative food. Um, but peanut has been, uh, was found to cause more severe reactions compared to hazelnut, egg, and milk um, in the study looking uh, for threshold doses of reaction. And then when we look at uh, de delayed epinephrine as a risk, uh, so while, uh, so initially reported by Bach, but then in the UK registry data, again, um, less than 10, so 6% of those um, fatalities had received appropriate epinephrine treatment. Um, when, when we try to pull data about delayed epinephrine out of some of the larger population-based studies that look at um, death certificate data, admission data, um, or 
emergency room visit data. It's harder to determine whether or if epinephrine was given and if it was given, when was it given in relation to the onset of symptoms. Um, so larger debt, uh, population studies, are it's more difficult to pull out that delayed epinephrine risk, but it's also important to note that there's no evidence that giving epinephrine prior to the development of a reaction prevents anaphylaxis. Um, so if you think, um, okay, well, it's possible that he ate an allergen, he, my child seems fine, but I'm worried about anaphylaxis, so I'm going to give the epinephrine now. Um, there's no evidence to support that that delays, I'm sorry, or prevents anaphylaxis. And if we look at asthma as a risk factor, it's a little difficult to use um, asthma generally uh, as a risk factor to really pull out high-risk um, people because asthma and food allergy run together. So the majority of people who have food allergy also have asthma. Um, there was a study trying to parse out that risk, and so they compared the risk of severe reaction after nut ingestion in um, severe asthmatics, um, where the risk of in, um, severe reaction was uh, six point times higher, 6.8 times higher than baseline. And in comparison, those who had mild asthma were only at a, a 2.7 times risk of uh, severe reaction after nut ingestion certainly more than baseline, but you can see that big difference between someone who is severely asthmatic and someone who is a mild asthmatic. Um, some other risk factors that have been um, seen in, some, in other studies have shown uh, severe allergic rhinitis is increased risk of severe reaction to nut. Um, certain cardiac medications, uh, beta blockers, COX inhibitors, and ACE inhibitors have all been reported as having the potential to increase the severity of um, an allergic reaction. And then exercise can both uh, trigger anaphylaxis alone, but can also um, contribute to food-triggered anaphylaxis. There is a, a group of patients who have, some, who have anaphylactic symptoms if they eat a um, causative food and then exercise uh, shortly afterwards. Um, wheat and shellfish te seem to be the foods that are most common in this uh, syndrome. And then from the studies looking at oral food immunotherapy, we know that being ill, having a viral illness at the time of ingestion has been shown to increase the risk of a reaction, even at a, a, a dose that these children have previously tolerated. So when we really try to focus on reducing the risk, the primary focus of risk reduction should be avoiding ingestion of the causative food for the food allergic person. Um, the caveat being that um, food proteins that have been aerosolized, so um, classically this is uh, fish that's being fried, can also cause reactions, but the vast majority of anaphylactic reactions occur following ingestion. And so in this context, ingestion means that food protein comes into contact with a mucosal surface. So ingestion can occur following um, taking a bite and spitting it out, uh, putting a finger or utensil with food protein in the mouth or um, what's called intimate or open mouth kissing. And so when we're trying to um, kind of parse out risk between ingestion and casual contact, uh, there was a study published in 2003 that looked at um, some common casual contact concerns. And these children were peanut allergic who um, had a history of reports of reaction to aerosolized food protein. And so they did a double-blind placebo-controlled study um, with uh, kind of two phases. The first phase was um, an inhalation challenge. So they mixed either peanut or soy butter with extracts from, I don't know, something disgusting like tuna um, to mask the scent. And then they were placed 12 inches from the face, and none of the children reacted to this inhalation challenge. And then they also did a skin contact challenge with a local, and about a third of the children developed local cutaneous reaction from one minute of skin contact with peanut butter. But none of the children developed a systemic reaction from that skin contact. Another source of ingestion is cross-contamination. So when cooking, utensils, dishes, bakeware um, should all be cleaned with soap and water before and after each use. Um, it's important that um, those who are cooking for food allergic people know that 
oils can seep through wax paper and liners, and so the use of those products on equipment doesn't um, take away their need to remove, um, doesn't remove the need to wash the equipment with soap and water. And I find that it's better to have a consistent policy, regardless of allergen involved, where um, utensils, equipment, bakeware are washed before and after each use, um, because if it's just the habit of those in the kitchen, then it's less likely that um, when an allergen is involved that the appropriate equipment cleaning will be missed. Um, and, how, and how do we clean our hands? How do we clean surfaces? Uh, so for a study was done that looked for um, peanut allergen on a variety of hands and surfaces with different cleaning methods. And so for cleaning tables, um, dish soap with a wipe uh, left some residual peanut allergen, but 409 spray, Lysol wipes, um, bleach wipes, those all removed um, all the peanut allergen from the table. And when looking at uh, hand washing, plain water and use of hand sanitizer left detectable peanut allergen on the hand, uh, but washing the hands with either liquid or bar soap and water um, or the use of commercial hand wipes uh, removed all the peanut allergen. Um, when we're talking about kissing, we really are talking about an, an open mouth kiss, not the sort of like peck from uh, an elderly aunt or grandparent. Um, and so when we look at a study from 2006 that looked for uh, peanut allergen in the saliva, um, it found that peanut allergen was present for about one hour after eating, even if the subject brushed their teeth right after eating. So when someone with food allergy has a romantic partner who is eating their allergen, um, their partner should wait an hour and ideally eat a food that does not contain the allergen um, to feel with a high certainty that that allergen has been removed from the saliva. Um, part of reducing risk involves um, identifying situations where the risk is higher and uh, taking steps to kind of reproducibly reduce the risk. So, um, for children, the higher risk situations are definitely school and child care, um, and then also eating out, family parties, you know, church potlucks, that kind of thing. Um, but at school, studies have shown that 15% of food allergic children report having had a reaction at school, and that 20 to 25% of allergic reactions that occur in school are in students who have no history of allergy. That initial school data um, was obtained in uh, 2000 and 2001. And so this rate of anaphylaxis in schools was evaluated again in the 2013-2014 uh, school year. Um, just to note, uh, this study, uh, the results of EpiPen for school study, this was uh, sponsored by Mylan, who make the EpiPen. Uh, so a survey was sent to representative schools in the United States with over 700 schools responding. Approximately 10% reported an episode of anaphylaxis in that 2013 to 2014 school year. Um, all ages were equally affected, but the high school students were more likely to be hospitalized as a result of anaphylaxis. But this study also showed uh, that 25%, that rate of 25% of reactions occurring in students with no history of allergy. As we try to attempt to reduce the risk in school, um, so the first one is making sure that appropriate treatment is available. Uh, so in 2013, President Obama signed into law the School Access to Emergency Epinephrine Act, and so at this time, all states have either passed or have legislation pending to allow for unregistered epinephrine autoinjectors to be available in school. Um, also in 2013, the CDC published voluntary guidelines uh, for managing food allergy in school. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a fairly large PDF document, but it is an excellent resource um, for families and schools to think about um, ways that they can reduce the risk uh, for food allergic children. Um, some schools and parents have a, a lot of questions about nut-free schools. Uh, the CDC voluntary guidelines did not recommend that schools go nut free. Uh, they recommended allergen free tables. Um, this was primarily due because there was very little data to support nut free schools. 
A recent study looked at the effect of peanut policies in schools. Um, they looked at schools in Massachusetts and the rate of epinephrine administration for peanut or tree nut exposure. Uh, they looked over a five-year period. <clears throat> they had a response rate from over half of the school nurses in Massachusetts, but it was information from about 24% of those school of schools in Massachusetts. Um, there was more epinephrine administration in schools that were designated as peanut free, um, but I think it's important to mention that, you know, everyone's peanut free is slightly different. And for instance, one reaction occurred from a food that was brought from the child's own home. But I think more importantly, the study compared schools with the following policies: so peanut free tables, peanut free classrooms, bans on bring, on bringing peanut um, to school and bans on peanut being served at school. And of these, only the use of peanut-free tables was associated with decreased epinephrine administration rates. All right, and then um, when we talk about reducing the risk of, of being a teenager, uh, sadly, there's no evidence-based guidelines for how to un-teenager your teenager. Uh, but this increase in risk-seeking behavior and the desire to sort of blend into the crowd is very typical of the adolescent developmental stage. And children with multiple chronic illnesses have worsening symptoms in adolescence. It certainly is not an issue that is um, unique to a food allergy. Um, I think communication is the kind of bedrock way to start with um, trying to mitigate the risk of being a young adult. Um, I would start with opening lines of communication with your food allergic child before adolescence. Um, so certainly when you think that they are old enough to start talking about it, but um, before, you know, they start to, you know, stop talking to you and slamming doors. <laughs> um, and you want to make sure they feel comfortable telling friends, family, caregivers, and food service workers about their food allergy. You want to really normalize that sort of um, communication. And then you want to make it a habit for the whole family to wash their hands before and after meals. And then I think using role-playing exercises can help increase comfort with recognizing and treating anaphylaxis in these food allergic children. Speci I mean, definitely if your child has not had a reaction since they were very young and they have no kind of memory of what that was like. Um, these are some, just some possible scenarios uh, to discuss with your teenager or young adult. Some of them are more appropriate for different ages, but they all have different goals. Uh, so the first is, um, you know, I'm at a friend's house and they ask if I want some food. This is a fairly basic one, but you just want to normalize the idea that food allergy is not a big deal. And it's also not a big deal to clarify, like, hey, can I check the label on that or who made that or, you know, can I ask what's in the food? The second scenario is I have a new girlfriend or boyfriend. Again, the primary goal is to normalize the, and to discuss the importance of sharing about that food allergy and how important it is that those that are close to you and care for you are aware of your food allergy. Uh, and then this is also a time to sort of discuss the risk of ingestion with open mouth kissing and you can role play how your teen might talk to their romantic partner about preventing that accidental exposure um, and really making sure they're sort of part of the same team in that regard. Uh, the third one is, oh, I like to go for a run, I like playing team sports, I like to hike. And this, the purpose of this scenario would be to find some solutions for how to keep the epinephro auto injector with your young adult um, in a way that's feasible and that's going to occur. You know, you want to make sure um, that you sort of don't just say, make sure you have your epinephrine with you all the time um, when we know that these are some of the scenarios where kids are going to say, oh, my pants are too tight or I don't have a pocket or um, whatever it is. We want to um, find some ways to work around those barriers. Um, I'm going to go to a party, you know, and I, and I might have a sip of beer. Uh, again, you know, talking when you think this is appropriate to talk about your child, but it's certainly something that should be included in the broader spectrum of talking about the risks of alcohol consumption. You know, in the same conversation where you talk about avoiding drunk driving and um, avoiding 
swimming when you're drunk, uh, you want to talk about the fact that if someone is impaired, uh, it's going to affect their decision making and that um, they need to be aware of the fact that impaired decision making could result in them potentially um, eating their food allergen and or um, finding themselves in a situation where they have misplaced their epinephrine auto injector. Um, and the last one is, I'm out with friends eating at a restaurant and I start having symptoms. I think talking about this role-playing scenario is a good way, well, number one, to talk about sort of what symptoms are consistent with anaphylaxis, you know, what do we worry about, but then also having the importance of having friends be aware of food allergy and what needs to be done in the case of symptoms. Um, and then also the importance of being responsible for carrying their own epinephrine auto-injector. So I think in that young adult adolescent period you have to start trying on responsibility and um, eventually they will be responsible for carrying their own epinephrine auto injector all the time um, as you know the parents aren't going to be around and won't be able to carry it for them so starting to engage in that process before it's necessary um, can be good practice and also do can help with problem solving and um, finding barriers and, and when issues come up working around them. Um, a lot of uh, food allergic families have, have you know, questions about quality of life and, and multiple studies have shown that children with food allergy and their parents report lower quality of life, though there is a trend towards improvement in quality of life as the children get older. Um, but I think it's important to note that you know, we think of food allergy being a, a potentially anxiety provoking. We're spending a lot of time about, you know, make sure you always ask about what's in our food and, and make sure you're ready for this. And we're adding some extra layers to these children's lives. But a recent study showed that um, children with food allergy did not have increased rates of anxiety. Um, when we're talking about reducing the risk of delayed epinephrine, um, this is really best achieved by making sure that the epinephrine auto-injector twin pack is always with the person who has food allergy. If the child's too young to administer the epinephrine themselves, make sure that caregivers are comfortable with when and how to give that epinephrine. And part of that um, is using a food allergy action plan. I, I very strongly recommend that every person with food allergy have a food allergy action plan on file at school, at camp, at sports, at childcare, sort of anywhere that um, person is when they're not going to be with someone who intimately knows them and their food allergy so that there's a, res there's a resource available if they start having symptoms. Um, and when we're talking about schools, I think it's important that um, staff at schools have some familiarity with how to use the epinephrine. Um, and then when we're talking about the risk of asthma, certainly having your, <laughs> the risk of fatal anaphylaxis is not the only reason to make sure your asthma is appropriately treated, but it is not a bad reason. Um, and so I want all my patients who have asthma to have their asthma under control so that they're able to, you know, play the sports if they want or engage in the world and not wake up every night coughing. But certainly if you have food allergy, that's an extra push to really making sure that your anaphylaxis is well controlled. Uh, sorry, making sure your asthma is well controlled so that uh, you can mitigate that risk uh, should you accidentally eat your allergen. Um, so in summary, the risk of phenyl anaphylaxis in food allergic persons is certainly real, um, but is not the highest risk um, thing that a food allergic person faces every day. And the identified risks of phenyl anaphylaxis are being a teenager or young adult, uh, the presence of asthma, having a peanut or tree nut allergy, and delayed epinephrine administration. And Focusing on sort of straightforward, reasonable habits, consistent communication, um, and preparation can help reduce the risk um, of anaphylaxis in persons who have food allergy. Thank you, Dr. Redmond. That was very informative and helpful for us to learn how to assess risk and, and reduce that risk. Um, we do have a lot of questions from the audience members. 
So if um, we will we will see how many questions we can get to during today's presentation, and we won't be able to answer all of them. But um, Dr. Redman has agreed to help us answer additional questions on the Kids with Food Allergies blog. Um, so we'll work on that um, in the upcoming days. So our first question today is. Is there a medicine that I can take daily or in advance of a risky situation to prevent anaphylaxis? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is a very useful question and I think obviously would be ideal. Um, and there is a, not a medicine that you can take every day uh, that can prevent anaphylaxis. So we know that um, oral antihistamines like um, Zyrtec or Benadryl um, can treat the mucosal symptoms of anaphylaxis, but they certainly don't prevent anaphylaxis from occurring. Um, there is some data looking at um, tolerance of oral immunotherapy that uses um, omalizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody uh, that is targeted against um, IgE, and that has been shown to decrease the rates of reaction in, ch in children who are on oral immunotherapy, but it's a, uh, number one, it's a monoclonal antibody, so it's very expensive, but equally it doesn't address the situation long term, so it only, it only works for the time that you're taking it, so um, it wouldn't, it doesn't work beyond the scope of taking that medication, so you wouldn't be able to be on it for your, like, your entire life, for instance, to prevent anaphylaxis, so it's not really practical as a, as a medication to prevent anaphylaxis. Okay, and a follow-up with that, we have some similar questions asking, for example, if someone is heading into what they think is a riskier situation, like say a family barbecue party or they're about to um, travel or something like that, um, they are asking, you know, can you take an antihistamine like Benadryl or Zyrtec in advance and would that prevent anaphylaxis? Right, so those um, those medications are not going to prevent anaphylaxis, and, and part of that is because they only really have an effect on some, um, but not all, of the organ systems that can be involved in anaphylaxis. So they're they're not going to prevent you from having um, bronchoconstriction or um, respiratory involvement, and they're not going to predict they're not going to prevent the the hypotension or or cardiovascular um, risk factors, and they're really probably unlikely to prevent um, GI symptoms as well. Uh, so I wouldn't, I think taking an antihistamine for other reasons is very appropriately, and, and if you already take one, I mean, there's no reason for you to stop taking one, certainly, but I don't think that taking one in advance of a barbecue is going to, um, there's no evidence that that would prevent anaphylaxis. Okay. The next question, is there a treatment that may make a child less allergic to their food allergies? Yeah, so um, in the course of the talk, I mentioned oral immunotherapy a few times in passing. So this is something, um, so oral immunotherapy, but then also um, epicutaneous uh, immunotherapy are being uh, looked at in research models to try to induce tolerance to food allergens. At this point, um, the rate of reaction to the uh, treatment um, seems to be fairly high and these processes are still being worked at. They're not quite ready for prime time, but I think it's very likely that in the next five to ten years there will be um, something available on the market that would um, help uh, children be able to tolerate more of the food they're allergic to. It's not going to necessarily remove the food allergy. The goal of those is to is for people to be able to tolerate um, an accidental ingestion. Okay. Next question. My 13-year-old took a bite of food that contained allergens. Luckily, nothing happened. What does that mean? And secondly, what should we do if my kid accidentally eats their allergens again? Yeah, so um, food allergy is a, is a dynamic process. So, for instance, we know that the vast majority of young children who have milk and egg allergy will outgrow those allergens, uh, will outgrow those allergies and develop tolerance to 
milk and egg as they get older. Um, so one possibility is that your child may no longer be allergic to the food that they were allergic to. Um, the other possibility is that um, they are able to tolerate more of the allergen that they previously were, a were able to tolerate. Um, and I think this is true of, of any time anyone um, accidentally eats something they're allergic to. Um, if nothing happens, you want to certainly monitor them closely, but you don't have to do anything specifically outside of monitoring. So like I mentioned when we were talking about delayed epinephrine, there, there's no evidence that giving epinephrine before the onset of symptoms prevents anaphylaxis. So just because you have an, a food allergy doesn't mean that you should use um, epinephrine at the, at the first sign. Now, um, with the caveat being there are uh, certain people who have a history of uh, very extreme reactions in their Allergists may prefer them to do that. Uh, that is, um, you know, certainly nothing I'm saying should should come between you and um, the advice given by someone who's caring for you directly. But um, in the vast majority of cases, um, epinephrine uh, is not indicated uh, if there are no symptoms. And so if your 13-year-old took a bite of a food that contained allergens and had no symptoms, um, that might be a reason to contact your allergist and say, hey, should, should we do repeat testing? Should we consider a challenge? Um, perhaps they're no longer allergic. Okay. Can the component test tell how bad your child's allergic reaction will be? Yeah. <clears throat> so the component test, and um, I suspect that this um, question refers to peanut component, te component testing, though um, other component tests are available. But um, none of the testing uh, that we have available, so neither um, skin prick testing or serum testing, can predict the severity of reaction. Um, the testing can assess risk of reaction, but not risk of severity of reaction. So component testing can help um, tease out if someone is making IgE to the component of, for instance, peanut that's associated with allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, and the component of peanut that is associated with cross-reaction from tree pollen. And so that can be uh, a useful um, tool to say, you know, even though this uh, skin test is pretty high. Um, when we did the component testing, and it seems like m the IgE is all of the component that we find cross-reacting with tree pollen, so maybe we should attempt a peanut challenge versus all of the serum um, is of the component that we that is associated with anaphylaxis, and so perhaps a food challenge might not be uh, useful or might not be indicated. Uh, but no testing can predict the severity of the allergic reaction. Okay. Can the symptoms of anaphylaxis change from one reaction to the next? My son's previous reactions included hive, sneezing, and wheezing. Can it change to include digest digestive symptoms in the future? Yeah, so the symptoms of anaphylaxis can change from one reaction to the next. So uh, a previous reaction does not necessarily predict future reactions, um, with the exception of if you have a history of anaphylaxis, you are, you're at risk for having anaphylaxis in the future, but just because you have only had a few hives in the past does not mean that you cannot have anaphylaxis in the future, and certainly um, it, the, the symptoms of that anaphylaxis in the future could be different. So if you have previously had hives and wheezing, it is very possible that you would have vomiting with the next, with the next ingestion. Um, we don't, uh, that, that's certainly possible, but we don't, we can't predict it from one reaction to the next. Okay. How can I keep my child calm if anaphylaxis happens? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. Um, we certainly don't have um, evidence-based guidelines for anaphylaxis specifically, but I think a big part of this is going to be trying to stay calm yourself, um, to be reassuring to your child, and then also um, to uh, 
kind of talk them through the process. So, I mean, again, depending on how old your child is, um, if your child is very young, it's just going to be sort of you remaining calm and then being reassuring. But if your child is slightly older, you can say, you can kind of walk them through and say, you know, you're telling me that your mouth is itchy and then, you know, we vomited, we, you know, we've talked about this, this, this seems like anaphylaxis, you know, I think here's the epinephrine, we're going to use the epinephrine auto-injector, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to have you lay down and, and we're going to put your feet up and then we're going to use it and sort of kind of walking them through it, keeping calm yourself and reassuring them through the process, um, I think can be helpful. Okay, and this might be the final question that we can take. Um, we were told by an ER physician that we should only use, or that we should use antihistamine first and only epinephrine when my son can't breathe. My son was having an anaphylactic reaction and I know it was right to use his epinephrine. How do we get emergency personnel to treat anaphylaxis appropriately? So this is a very uh, common um, kind of issue that I have come up with my um, patients and this is something that um, the best thing is to advocate for your child I think um, and then also uh, by saying you know this is anaphylaxis if you have your food allergy action plan with you um, you can show that to the emergency personnel there are certainly um, from the top down in the emergency room um, national bodies, there have been um, kind of updated position papers and statements reiterating the importance of using epinephrine um, for anaphylaxis. And there are also, I, I'm aware of uh, a few research projects that are um, trying to increase awareness in the ER setting. Um, but unfortunately, uh, all we can do is um, advocate for our patients and then advocate for our children. So I think if you um, can say, you know, this is anaphylaxis, and if you say this is this is what my allergist gave me. Um, but the other thing is that, um, you know, you don't have to wait to go to the emergency room to use epinephrine. So if you if you feel like your child um, is having anaphylaxis and, and and you know it's right to use his epinephrine, you can give your the epinephrine auto injector. You um, because the other time that we have seen some issues is uh, with um, EMS, uh, so not all EMS providers are aware of the diagnosis of anaphylaxis and, and that epinephrine is the first line treatment. And so again, um, you're the best advocate for your child. And so, you know, knowing that and staying firm is probably the best way that you can um, impact the care for your child. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, we will try to answer additional questions um, in our follow-up to this webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Redmond. Um, we do have some giveaways. We've randomly selected three winners to receive gift packages from AFA. Um, the first gift is a prize package that includes certified asthma and allergy-friendly products from Swiffer, Indust, Kids Preferred, and Owens Corning. The winner's names will be announced in the chat box now, so go ahead and take a look to see if your name is, is mentioned. And then we also have two winners receiving an Allerzip allergy relief mattress encasement that is certified asthma and allergy-friendly. There are a wide variety of products that have been certified, and you can find them at aafa.org slash certified. You can also download our app in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. You can search through products and read the full details about why a product is certified. We also wanted to share with you that coming soon, Kids with Food Allergies is launching an online program to help train parents and caregivers on how to manage food allergies. So many of you had submitted questions about, um, you know, understanding ana anaphylaxis a little bit more, how to recognize the symptoms and stuff like that, and we will be covering that in our new program. Thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Redmond, and thank you to Myland Specialty for providing support to make today's presentation possible. And we thank everyone for attending. Don't forget to take the feedback survey when you leave. Also, if you'd like to see more programs like these, consider supporting AFA and Kids with Food Allergies. 
with a donation. Just go to kidswithfoodallergies.org slash donate and see all of the many ways you can support our work on behalf of those with food allergies. We also encourage you to join our online support communities if you haven't already. To find the food allergy support community, go to community.kidswithfoodallergies.org. Thank you, everyone.